you, thank you. All right, L let's begin talking digital security in fact and in fiction. Actually, this title worked out ex extremely well for me because it really does cover two different aspects of my life. Uh, go to the next one, please. Uh, this is a novel that I wrote several years ago um, that actually, among other things, it's a very complex book. There's a lot of different threads in it. But one of the primary ones is a group of people that set up private markets uh, that are completely separated, enclosed. No one can intrude. No one can do anything to them. They're protected by walls of encryption that can't be broken. And all the things that happen to them, external and internal, to set this up. Next one, please. Yeah. This is, in fact, this is a company that myself and my partner have created over the last several years. Um, to make a long story short, we make people anonymous on the internet. Uh, I'll explain a little bit further as we get further into it, but this is something that was very important to us, and that's what we did. Now, it's interesting, these two work together very well, because when I wrote the novel. One of the, one of the really important things about a novel, the thing that makes it unique among art forms, is that you get to crawl inside the mind of really interesting people. Um, in a work of visual art, you can show things, you show expressions, you choose what people are doing, you choose how you show it to evoke certain feelings, but in a novel, you can understand what this person is thinking. And when I write it, I can tell you what they are thinking. And if I choose well, and if I do my job well, I can give you the internal experience of an exceptional human being. And that's, very, that's the only place I know you can do it in that depth, in that kind of detail, repetitively in a book. And you can see how this person evolves, how they grow, how they change the difficult points of their life. What are the things that they're struggling with to make this choice? In a novel, I can give that all to you, as well as illustrating it and telling a really good story. So these two went together very well, because in Wayfaring Men, I'm telling the story of people who create not this, but this, something in this vein. And all of the internal struggles they go through to create this, to take risks, to do things that are going to be disapproved, to do things that could maybe get them in some sort of trouble or another, and to make those choices, to step over those lines knowing that it's going to be hard, knowing that there are risks, and to do it. So these two went together very nicely for me. Um, you can go to the next one, please. The, the real impetus behind both the book and the service that we run was really this. Um, I don't really write books to make money, although I really would like to make money from them. Um, I don't, we didn't make the company so just we could make money. We want to make money, we are making money with it. But it's more than that. Now I'm going to, here are two sections here. I'll take out my very, very cool laser pointer. Uh, this top one is something I wrote for a crypto hippie presentation I was making to a group. It's never before have men and women been able to communicate with almost any other person in the world, regardless of distance and almost without cost. This is a completely new, deeply intimate, and immensely hopeful set of abilities and far too serious to allow anyone to control, especially politicians. Uh, it really is a big deal. Now, here's the way it came across in the novel. Uh, this is one of my characters speaking. And you can see where I'm trying to show, just a little bit in this passage, what's going on inside of him. The internet has to be protected. We can't let it become a tool of the old territorial rulers. So we're building a center of private interactions where rulers can't intrude. It was a strange moment when several of us looked around the room and said to each other, oh my god, we can't let this opportunity pass. We're the adults. We have to step in and see to this. We're here. We're able. It's fallen to us. And this is really this case of the internet now. Uh, the internet is actually in danger. Uh, if you flip to the next slide, please. Um, but it's really important in a lot more ways than setting up a business, as good as that is. There's no, I'm, not, I'm not demeaning that. Uh, let me just 
go through this uh, a little bit. First of all, reducing the lifespan of bad information. Let's take an example of this. Let's say several hundred years ago, um, this has happened all, all over the world. You get a group of people live on this side of the hill. You know those people on the other side of the hill. Something terrible happened. There was a great clash and there was a problem and they killed a bunch of people over here and they're horrible. Well, the guys on the other side of the hill had the same story in reverse. And such ideas like that, when you hear it from your parents and your grandparents and they heard it from their grandparents, they stick. And, and they are just things that people presume to be true. Now, we have all sorts of information we can get on this thing as it happens. Somebody may have videotaped part of it. We certainly have eyewitnesses whose, whose testimony can be recorded permanently, shared, compared, analyzed, and probably we find out that a guy in this side of the hill named Jim and a guy in that side of the hill named Bob were just real hotheads. And they were both jerks and they were both behaving stupidly and you know they hit each other or somebody got hurt, maybe even killed and the lifespan of bad information collapses. And this is, I'm just giving you one example. This handles, happens in all sorts of ways. And it's a very, very big deal. Because this is not just one thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about hundreds and all of the tentacles that spread out from that through a group of people. The next one is replacing gatekeepers with peer review. Um, one of the things that I picked up from someone else that I like to say is that at not too many years ago, 95 or 98 percent of all news came out of two zip codes in Manhattan from a mostly homogenous group of people. And I don't know if that's precisely too true, but it's close. Um, and there were gatekeepers, and very few people got through the gatekeepers. Once you did, boy, you were really hit, you hit the big time, but very few people did, and it was a fairly homogenous view of the world. That has now been broken. Um, 2004, everyone knows the story. Uh, the mighty Dan Rather of CBS News was brought down by quote unquote guys in their pajamas. Regardless of whether it was horse A or horse B, they got hurt in the race. The mighty CBS News was broken by a group of guys in their jammies sitting around computer terminals analyzing font types. It's a, it's, this has been broken. The third one is important. Anonymous, no-risk trial of ideas. Um, people complain all the time about anonymity, and some of the complaints are legitimate. People do do stupid things and use anonymity for stupid reasons. Then again, people use telephones for stupid reasons, too, and we don't ban telephones. Um, here's the important part. Lots of us, especially when we're young, have silly ideas and develop silly ideas. We also know that if we talk about silly ideas or ideas that somebody thinks are silly, or especially if an authority thinks are silly, we get shamed. We get shut down. This we has, happens in school all the time. It may lead to other results, uh, other bad results. As a result, we tend to hold ideas in. It is better for us to throw the ideas out and test them. Anonymity gives people a hedge to hide behind while and put out these ideas into the common discussion. Uh, in that case, some of the ideas will be good, which is nice. A lot of them will be bad, but they have a chance for the bad ideas to show up as bad, rather than holding them in because you're afraid to put them out and they never get improved, and too often they never get changed. I say this, and it sounds a little flamboyant, but it really is true. Anonymity is a personal growth technology. It is. Okay. Um, again, it's complex. Things go wrong sometimes. People use it badly. I can't help that. That's human nature. People are conflicted. Tough. It, but it is very good at, at, for this cause. Um, somebody will remind me if I'm getting close to the end. Thank you. Um, providing and distributing recording of events, the bad policeman behaving badly, um, things, we've, things of that sort, you can use your imagination. The disarming of collective identities, uh, which has led to God only knows how many millions of deaths and various genocides. Um, grandpa says, all gypsies are evil people, they're horrible. Grandson says, you know, Grandpa, 
I, I have, that's not true. I have a friend, and he's a gypsy. I know him on the internet. And I'm sure some of them are bad, but they're not all bad. When those type of ideas break up, all sorts of follow-on effects from them break up and lose their, lose their root, lose their potency. And again, these are things that happen millions of times a day below the radar that we don't really see in most cases. We see just those that apply to us. And the last item here is very important. I call it the exponential spread of epiphanies. I really don't know any way to say it better. I have a really great idea. Let's say I'm a writer, okay? So I have a great idea. I write it in a book. It takes time to get it in the book. It takes time to spread. It takes time to do all these things. And most people aren't writers. And they're not going to put it in the book. It's a special skill. It's a, it's, it's a particular craft. Most 99% of the people aren't going to do that. But if they have a good idea and they have some, you know, really, wow, this could mean this, and they have a real slick idea on it, they can put it on the internet, and all of a sudden twos, fours, six, eights, tens, and twelves all have this idea. And those form building blocks in people. If it's a good idea, it stays there, it grows, and it becomes something. And not just in one, but spreading all out through the internet, through all these people that are communicating. Again, these are things that happen below the radar, but they have very serious long-term effects. This is hugely positive technology, if you would, please. Okay, the conquest of the internet. I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail right now. Uh, as it turns out, <laughs> wonderfully, wonderful timing. There's an article on lourockwell.com that I wrote. It's in the weekend edition this week where I am, where I explain exactly what all these things are and how it, and, how, and what they are doing and how. And it's very, very, very bad. Um, but I won't go through it now. lourockwell.com, this weekend edition, it's up. It's called uh, The State Versus the Internet. A very Lou Rockwell title. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, next one, please. I do want to toss one thing in here because the guy who runs Google is just turned evil, evil, evil. Um, these are just a few of the quotes that he's, he said recently. Uh, the top one about Facebook photos, we can identify you. Next one, we can predict where you're going to go Tuesday morning. Uh, the bottom one, the only way to manage this is true transparency and no anonymity. In a world of asynchronous threats, it's too dangerous for there not to be some way to identify you. We need a name service for people. Governments will demand it, and they'll provide it. Um, they, Google is very close to some of the three-letter agencies and associated contractors um, that are their friends. Um, I can't prove the precise connections, but they're there. Next one, please. Okay, uh, formatting's just slightly off, but you're clever people, you'll understand. Um, in fiction, this is, the, this is the way a system of anonymity worked. Um, we, there were two versions of it in the book. One was called Tango, the other was called Gamma. Um, Tango was, in, was composed of encryption, uh, using game pieces as cash and, as tap, and with tapped fibers. Um, Game pieces as cash actually happened in real life a little bit and, and may be happening now for all I know in what they call massively multiplayer online games. And people will trade pieces for dollars or euros or yen or whatever else. And it, Second Life did it for a while. I don't know what's, what's going on with it now. But there were cases where they were trading Linden dollars for actual dollars. Somebody wanted to put an ATM in the middle of, of the game. Um, so, encryption is here now. Game pieces as cash is 100% possible. I'm not, I don't keep track of it. I don't know who is or isn't doing it at the moment. Uh, and tapped fibers is possible, uh, but non-trivial. Um, this happened to be one of my, one of my businesses for a while. The, I was in the fiber optic business. I'm still somewhat associated with it. So, I had fun with that one, you know explaining how somebody could get in and, and tap a fiber, you know. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, the second iteration in the book was called Gamma. Uh, encryption, again, is here now. Uh, we used private protocols, which so far as fiction could be done. It's not easy, uh, but it can be done. Um, and then decentralized servers, which are many servers all serving, all putting the signal in any which way 
no one knows where, when, and how. That's doable now. It's here now. Uh, next, please. I'm just going to show you quickly how some of this is done in real life. Uh, this is the first basic link. It's very simple. Uh, it comes from your machine, and then we create, they call it a tunnel, whatever it is. It's an encrypted connection that goes to the beginning of our network, and it runs right through your local ISP, uh, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, whoever you've got. It runs right through them, and they can't read a thing. They can see that there's bits going across, but if they want to look at it, just a long, fast stream of gibberish. It doesn't mean anything. Next, please. And this is the way it's done. I'm sorry, go back for just a second. This one has been done. It's done by, by other people. They used to use it in the old days. They called them uh, uh, anonymous, uh, um, oh gosh, proxies. Uh, it was very, very cool in the 90s. Um, it's not enough anymore. Go ahead, next, please. Uh, that part is just this right here, this link here. And this is an anonymity network. It, it, um, this is a diagram of ours. Um, it brings you in in one country, brings you out in another country, uh, and it's kind of a mix master in between. It could go this way, it could go this way, it could go here. It's all random. Um, and there's other things that are done. You rotate IP addresses, you use special tokens, the techie stuff isn't important, but it's an anonymity network, uh, and it really does make people anonymous on the internet. Next, please. Um, this is ours, uh, whatever. Uh, it's um, one particular one that we sell. Uh, if anybody's interested, I've got free trial cards. Come talk to me. I'll be glad to give you one. Next, please. Okay. How am I doing on time? Good. I went faster than I thought I did. Okay. This is important here. Fiction is easier than fact. Um, for lack of a better word, humans are composed of two systems. Uh, I, another one of my books I wrote last year on this, it's called Entropy and Divinity. Um, two systems, the animal and the emergent. For anybody who's a, a real theologian or philosophy student here, I'm not really a dualist, but nonetheless, there are two different systems. Um, we have uh, an animal sort of system and an emergent system, which is consciousness. The two don't always play nicely together, which is why we have conflicts in every area from reproductive imperatives to being scared and behaving badly when we're scared. It's two different sort types of systems. I won't go through all the details here, but consciousness is really kind of opposed to the animal sort of system, uh, to instinct. Um, fiction is not threatening. We get to observe with no risk. Real life is a lot more scary when you're going to actually do things, set things up, put your name on it sometimes, have to sell the thing, Everything could go wrong. People could say bad things about you. People could ridicule you in public. Those things are hard to do. Fiction is much, much easier. Next. Um, this is something probably doesn't apply to too many people in this room, but I really do want to talk about it because I think it's something that kind of needs to be an open idea uh, in the freedom sort of people. Uh, there's this unspoken model, and I felt it, and if I have, I'm, I'm sure that just about everyone else has, is that we talk and write so brilliantly and so well that other people will rise up and fight for freedom. And we don't really have to take the risks. We'll just write, uh, I put at the end, we write, they fight. Um, but it really is, I mean, if I felt it, probably most everyone else has. Uh, and, it's, and it's a bad model. The model includes no risk with a full reward. It's kind of a classic dream of a free lunch. Um, it's risk avoidance. It's not what we need. It's a bad model. We can never pontificate well enough to get every detail that's just right and tell everybody what they're going to have to do in a new sort of system. They've got to do it. The best details will never be found without trial and error. I don't care how brilliant you are, 
any system of people living without state, without oversight, whatever it is, involves millions and millions of people who are not you, who think differently than you. And they're all going to have to play nice together and work out the, deal, the details themselves together. And even more importantly, you need, we all need to act. Not just talking is good, writing is good. God, no, God only knows I've written lots and lots of books. So I'm not criticizing writing. I'm not criticizing teaching. But to be a full person with a, with a full development, we must also act. Acting changes us. It makes us better. We are not disembodied spirits. We're integrated human beings. We have to act if we're going to develop properly. Next slide, please. Now, we already have a lot of free territory. Usually this, this goes under the name of crypto-anarchy. Whatever, uh, you know, there's so many terms, so many different names. Um, but it usually goes under the name of crypto-anarchy. It's not a free lunch, but it's as close as we'll ever get. By using encryption as city walls, we can separate lots and lots and lots of territory, and nobody can enter. They can't get in. So we, we throw up these city walls, which are free. We throw up these city walls, and we can do all kinds of things. Now, we don't have physical action, but we can use it as a break in between physical actions to break, to break uh, connections. Um, we have communication. We have currency. We have law. And yes, it has been done, and it has worked. Um, we have law. We have more if we build it. It's just sitting there. You throw up a, a, a wall of encryption around some place. Inside that place, you have perfect liberty. You got it now, here. It's there. Um, we can build all kinds of things in there, all kinds of interactions, all kinds of services. It can be done. Is it quite as easy as going on to Facebook? No, it's not. You're going to have to work. It's harder. You have to go through um, various protections. You have to have various types of passwords. You have to get somebody who trusts you to show you where the front door is. You have to build trust. But it's there. Free. Or net, almost free, put it that way. We have to, somebody has to rent a server. But that's not, it's not terribly expensive. Um, bottom section, yes, something could go wrong, sure. Things can go wrong with this. There's risks. Eventually, somebody could get hurt. Some you know, bad guy could rip somebody off. Things could go wrong. Yeah, it's possible, sure. It can happen. But things go wrong in the safe realm every day. Um, it, it's really a battle of risk avoidance versus emergence. Uh, in a very real way, if the internet keeps developing, and if these type of thing I'm talking about at the beginning spread, and if we put up free territories and people spend time in them and develop themselves in these free territories with free, equal interactions with other human beings, I call it an emergence because it'll change people. And when enough people change, a lot of other things are going to change with it. That's what I think of the internet. Please. I don't know if anyone's using it as, as a game or not. Um, I haven't, you know, I, that's one area that I just haven't had the time to follow. It's quite, quite possible. But I don't know if anyone's doing it or not. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, again, this may or may not apply to anybody here. Take it for what it's worth, but remember the concept. The enemies of the internet have will and have action. They're acting every day to rein it in. Throw a cordon around the city, separate it out, get the bad guys out, and hand the, hand the taken city over to their pals. Every day, they're doing this. They're not hesitating. They are acting. What are we doing? Now, I don't know. Everyone, you know, I don't have any master plan for anybody to follow. But I know that everybody 
who cares about liberty, needs to be acting in some way. Next, please. Um, this, is some, this is the same sentiment. Do we really mean to be free or don't we? The dividing line between them is action. Do we really mean to be free? If we really do, we have to act. If we're not willing to act, how, how, how much do we mean it really? Next one, please. And I love this because this is the same exact thought from 2,000 years ago. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, he's a wise man who built his house on a rock. Whoever hears these same exact sayings and doeth them not, he's a foolish man who built his house on the sand. It's the same exact sentiment. It's the same exact problem. And this, again, is the problem that I tried to cover and show in Wayfaring Men, how these people made these decisions themselves. And I'm done. Thank you. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah? Sir. Yes. Uh, what do you think of uh, Stark Page and how well you think it works? Of which? Stark Page. They're advertising so you can, you can look anonymously. It's a search engine that, was, that, that doesn't save any of the... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. But there have been a couple others. I think it's a fine idea. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very nice idea. The problem with all of these technologies now is that mass surveillance is really, really big. Um, it's been done for years. They're, be, they're doing it now. And to correlate things is not hard. Um, that's why that first uh, example I showed you of the, you know, you know, the encrypted tube, the, the anonymous proxy, um, it really doesn't do it anymore because all of the agencies and private contractors and Eastern mafias and everybody else are surveilling the Internet every day, and it's really easy to correlate. This one came here, and this one left here. It's, it's not hard to do it all anymore. So the, the, the anonymous proxy, and even this one, it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea, but it's not enough by itself. But it is, it's, a, it's a good idea. Yes, next. Somebody else had a hand up. Oh, please. Okay. Perhaps an answer to the, like, the remixer, the remailers, and all that stuff. And now, like you say, they can put in a little bit of a delay and go through a bunch of more things. But really, it's tough. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Essentially, ham radio for, for internet. Yeah. It's a very good idea. Um, actually, we we have um, a plan on the drawing boards for such a thing. Hopefully, we get it done in a year or two, because I don't know. Maybe I'm pessimistic about this, but I deal with it every day. And I really am concerned that the Internet is going to be just totally owned by the state. Um, right now, to surveil everything on the Internet uh, for a year costs a handful of billion dollars. Well, it's a lot for you and me, but that's not a lot for, for a government. Um, it requires you know, a lot of things. You have to have you know, agents who will get you a router into a certain spot and put it in for you. That's what these guys do. Um, so it's really not that hard to surveil the entire internet. And I'm really concerned about it. Um, and one of the answers is precisely that. If they just really take it over and slam it and are just gathering everything out of it, um, then the idea that does work is packet radio or a uh, ham radio idea for internet. And now with the really good um, uh, Wi-Fi, for lack of a better term, uh, wireless internet, and getting an occasional link here and there, it really can be done. It's not going to be with a deep graphic environment like we have now, but you'll be able to get necessary communications from place to place. 
and I think it's something that we have to look up, look at seriously as a backup a few years from now. Uh, hopefully it never comes to that, but I'm concerned enough that it does that we're going to try to get some people together and have people just code protocols for doing it and just give them away. Because if it, the internet goes down, if, if, it's, if it gets as bad as I fear it may, then it's, we just, it's way too important to lose. It really had, the internet actually happened mostly by accident. Uh, one second, David, I'll get right to you. Uh, it happened mostly by accident. Uh, to make a very long story short, Sputnik went up in 1957 and scared the hell out of the U.S. government. The Russians were ahead. So what they did is they got their smart guys, who usually you know, were in the, usually kept in the corner somewhere, you know, slaving away somewhere, and they said, hey, we want you guys in a room, we want you all working together and make us some stuff that's really important and interesting and see what you can come up with. And these guys developed all sorts of things, one of which became later the Internet. The Internet was decommissioned by the military, I think it was 89, they forgot about it. And it was a surprise when just a couple programmers, one guy out of Illinois, one guy out of Sweden, came up with bits and pieces that turned it into something. It emerged spontaneously. No one expected it. And it caught ruling types by surprise. And it is the greatest opportunity we've ever had that I can think of in modern times. It's, it's just, they're, they're tearing it up, they're cutting it up, they're, they're taking it apart. And it's, we can't let it happen. David. Did you hear what um, Senator Lieberman had to say earlier in the summer about how it's necessary to take people in and he's an example of how China has been set up to do that as well? Yeah, I heard, I, I, I don't remember if I remember that passage, but I remember him talking about it and I was, obviously I was horrified. Um, Lieberman, Joe Lieberman. Uh, there's an act, I don't recall the name of it, it's in the Lou Rockwell article, um, that they are putting together and it has passed the, the Senate committee in a unanimous vote and it passed. And it hasn't gone to the House and Senate yet, but it essentially gives the President the ability to seize critical infrastructure which, what's critical infrastructure? Well, it's whatever the experts say it is, and they can seize it. How? Well, it doesn't specify. It's however the experts want to seize it. I can tell you what it means. It means that they take control over internet backbones, which are the main lines. Um, so it's a very, very, very frightening piece of legislation. Yes? Uh, there's always been a rumor that the hackers of the world will counterattack. Yeah, there has been. Uh, rumors about hackers counterattacking. I've heard of this. I'm waiting. I would like to see them move. Um, I mean, these guys, they wrote the programs. You know, they wrote them. If there's back doors, if there's secret ways, if there's, there's somebody who knows them. I mean, hackers are, are usually very bright guys. And, you know, they, they have long memories, too. And they tend to be kind of our sorts of anti-authority type of guys. I, w I do get you know little little comments from time to time. In the novel, uh, I made a um, a report that existed in the White House, written in the middle 90s, about oh my God, here's this thing called the internet. How can this hurt us? And it is an, you know it was a um, a memo and it was very secret and hush hush and I wrote about it in the book well one day some guy showed up on an anonymous an anonymous chat room you really high hyper encrypted anonymous chat room and says you're the guy aren't you and I said you from the book yeah I'm the guy he says you know that memo you talked about he says there was one it wasn't in the White House it was one of the agencies but there really was one he says, maybe someday if I ever can find it in an archive, I'll get you a copy. I said, oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> but so, I, you know, I don't know. It was, an, it, was, you know, it was a disembodied voice in a chat room. But the way the gentleman spoke, I believed it. So maybe I wanted to believe it a little bit too, but in any event, uh, I think it is true. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you both.